There, can everyone hear me now? If you can hear me, if you would just type a little note in the question box, that would be great. All righty, so we're talking today about uh, grocery shopping and healthy eating on a budget. So we're going to talk about technology trends in grocery shopping. We're going to talk about tackling the uh, grocery store using coupons, meal planning, and the art of leftovers. So let's start out looking at some shopping technology. All righty, here's a big busy graph. Uh, the main thing that this tells us is that people are using their devices as they're grocery shopping. And this graph shows about uh, uh, how people use that technology before the trip and in the store. So if you look over on the left hand side, starting with the uh, red bar, that tells us that prior to shopping, 32% of shoppers search online coupons. And then 23% use their mobile devices to check prices, 20% to check uh, products out to research them, 19% to make shopping lists, 16% <clears throat> to read product reviews, and that's all before they get out the door. At the store, 19% will track their shopping list there at the store, uh, that is 16%. 13% uh, check recipes, 9% uh, will track their spendings, they'll check coupons, they'll research products, 8% check prices, 7% uh, look at the nutrition information, and um, They'll also scan the shelf labels, and then 5% try to locate products in the store. Um, I know that uh, one of our local stores, Publix, uh, you can go onto their uh, website, and as you click on products, it will automatically load and produce a shopping list. So there's just a lot of ways you can make your shopping trip easier with technology nowadays. So... Some high points, 32% use online coupons, 23% check prices online before they go to the store, and 19% of people make shopping lists on their mobile devices. So once we get to the grocery store, what are some strategies for saving money? Um, so what do Americans spend the most money on at the grocery store? And for this, we're going to do a poll question on your, um, on your screen. Let me get this set up here. All right, you should see the question and four answers. All righty. Can y'all see that? Let's see here. All right. I see you are working on it. All righty. 70% of you have voted. Okay, a little bit more time here, and we'll see what what your answers are. You can phone a friend if you need to. All right, a couple more seconds, then we're going to close this poll, find out what y'all thought. All righty, we'll go ahead and close the poll now, and I will share your Results. Okay, so now you should be able to see uh, the poll results. And 25% of you said fruits and vegetables, 50% said meats, and 25% of you said processed foods. And the um, correct answer is 
C, processed foods. So um, let's see here. All righty. So C, processed foods, is the correct answer on that. All righty. Now then, um, we're going to look at some information on that, some statistics. This is a, uh, a chart that shows how money has been spent on groceries in about a 30-year period between 1982 and 2012. And so about uh, almost 12%, 11.6% um, was uh, spent on processed foods back in 1982. And you can see that here in this uh, yellow bar. And then it went up, pretty much doubled to 22.9, or I would round that to 23% in 2012. Uh, the other food categories didn't change a whole lot. I guess meats went down by 10%, but otherwise fruits and vegetables are similar, and the others aren't as big um, a, a difference as the processed foods. Um, and obviously there are many um, reasons for that, including how many more processed foods are on the market nowadays. Part of what we'll talk about today will be some uh, economical and quick strategies for bringing back more whole foods to your dinner table and trying to stay away from the processed foods. We have more and more and more evidence as time goes on that they're just not that good for us. We all probably use a few here and there, but the more you can keep that to a minimum, the better for your health and the better for your budget. All right, now then. So when you are preparing to go to the grocery store, one of the best things you can do is plan, plan, plan. Um, and we all pretty much know this, so it's just a matter of how, how much time are we going to spend on it. Even if you just sit down for five minutes before you go out the door and jot down some ideas, or you may be a big planner and you may have your uh, grocery list like the one pictured here, this divided into categories. Uh, one good way to use this would be to keep it handy in the, in the kitchen, say up on the refrigerator, and during the week as you're noticing what you need or as you plan next Tuesday's meal, you can add to that list and then have it ready to go. And like we talked about earlier, you can certainly do the same thing on your phone your, or your other device, but something in the way of a list will help keep you on track it will actually save you time, and it will save you money, too, help keep you focused on what you need versus what you want. Um, also, when you make a meal plan, uh, that focuses your attention on the essential ingredients for those meals. And you can also save money by sometimes using, say, a larger can of tomatoes in the um, chili, and then that same ingredient in another dish later on in the week so that you can buy in bulk. So again, if you just take a few minutes to plan these things out, that's one of the keys. You know, we have to know where we're, uh, how we're going to get there in order to know where we're going. And so that will save time. And try to follow your budget. You know, if, you, if it's hard for you to stay on budget when you uh, know you can zip the credit card through the machine, then carry cash and then you will have to stick to that budget. Um, also know your grocery store sale cycle. If you go to the same store again and again, um, you'll, you'll notice their trends, and that can help you save money as well. Sometimes even at um, the store I shop on Wednesdays, it's Senior Citizen Day, so just knowing when they might offer a special discount. Um, and then they'll have certain things on sale when the kids go back to school. They'll have... Um, an Italian week, and they'll have those types of foods on sale. So know your grocery store sale cycle. And then probably the biggest thing of all is don't go hungry, because we all, myself included, will buy more food, and we'll buy more food we don't particularly need if we're hungry. 
Um, so carry a snack, eat before you go, just don't go hungry. Now, um, once you're at the grocery store, um, allow time to surf the shelves so that you have a minute to read your labels. Um, you know, if you need to look for some low sodium products, for example, um, just allow a little bit of extra time for that. Comparing your prices and looking at the unit price, that might be the price per ounce, the price per unit, which means the whole thing, the price per pound, and hopefully those units will be the same so you can compare apples to apples when you're trying to choose between a couple of different brands or a couple of different, different sizes. Larger sized packages like cans of food aren't necessarily always cheaper. You just have to look and see. Um, and if it's things like um, uh, canned tomatoes, canned beans, um, you know, those dry goods, uh, when they're on sale, obviously, that's a good time to stock up. Um, now, this is one of my favorite tips that I tell my patients all the time, and I do it myself, is the prep time after you shop. And I'm just a big believer in this. Uh, when you're trying to eat healthy and you go to the grocery store and you have your plastic bags of all your wonderful fruits and vegetables, um, if you come home and shove them in the vegetable drawer, you're going to probably or many times will end up with really expensive compost. But if you take those bags and you set them by your sink and you get out your cutting board, your knife, and your colander and wash what you can. Now, some stuff you can't wash ahead of time, like berries or mushrooms, but everything else, you can pretty much um, chop up your carrots, go ahead and, and cut your broccoli into chunks. You can slice your cantaloupe and have those things ready to grab and go during the week, whether it's to grab to throw into your lunch bag or to grab to dump into your pot to make a quick meal that evening. I just think that's valuable time. And while you've got that one cutting board and that one knife, if you're doing all of that food processing, you're not having to get it out and wash it 15 times of the week. You're just doing it that one time. So that's a great time saver. It, at least it is for me. All righty. Now then, the um, tackling the grocery store and starting from scratch Generally speaking, um, it's cheaper to buy foods that are uh, less prepared or in their whole state, um, depending on what's on sale. You know, if, if chicken uh, thighs are on sale that week, it might be um, as cheap or cheaper than some larger pieces. Usually the whole chicken is the cheapest um, if you um, want to cook that, and a lot of times your store butcher will trim it up a little, uh, maybe cut it in half so you can roast two halves instead of one whole. So you can inquire with your butcher and just see what all that they will do for you. Um, but when you can, choose foods in their whole state. Generally uh, speaking, more prepared it is, the more expensive it will be. And certainly when it's a, a more highly processed food, a lot of times it lacks the nutrients of the whole foods, things that are uh, made with white flour, for example, or a rice mix with white rice and a lot of um, salts, sugars, preserv preservatives versus regular rice, which actually is brown rice. That's the way rice starts out, brown rice. Um, so some other examples will be, would be bagged lettuce versus loose or head lettuce, uh, pre-cut vegetables versus the whole, and chicken pieces like chicken breast versus the whole chicken. Something that um, I've noticed with lettuce, I can buy a bag of three chunks of romaine lettuce, and it's so much cheaper than the bagged lettuce. It stays fresher longer because it hasn't been cut, and it's really easy to prepare. It doesn't take that much time. I do buy bagged um, lettuce or the, you know, the, the clear boxes of the spinach, the spring mix, the arugula, those kinds of things. But anymore, I tell you, for my uh, romaine lettuce, it, it just hasn't been helpful to me if I bought a bag of it, and it costs a lot more, and a few days later, it's rotten, and I don't have it to eat anyway. So for me, the uh, romaine lettuce bought whole is the best way to go there. Also, as we go along, if y'all have some ideas that work for you, um, feel free to share them 
And again, just type them in the question box and I'll be sure to see them. Uh, let's have another poll question. Let's do that. Whoops, okay, we don't want to do that. Let's go back to our, hold on one second. Okay, here's our next poll question. So this poll question is, where do you generally find the healthiest foods in the grocery store? A, the perimeter of the store, B, aisle B, C, frozen foods, or D, the parking lot. So far, about half of you have voted, about two-thirds of you have voted. I bet some of y'all have heard about this one before. Just a little bit more time, and then we will close out this poll. All righty. Two seconds. Poll's closing. All righty. So 88% of you said A, the perimeter, and 13% of you said uh, C, frozen foods. The answer is the perimeter of the store. It's a generalization, but typically in a store, typically in a store, you've got the um, fresh foods around the edges, like the meat department, the dairy department, the produce department, and it's those interior aisles that would have the boxed and cans and packaged things. Not that those are all bad, but that's also where you'll typically find more of your um, junk food. Uh, so shopping the perimeter is kind of a standard uh, practice for um, healthy shopping and most often economical as well. So good job. All righty. Now then, um, also going on to fresh items at the grocery store, and here's uh, some that you would find probably around the perimeter, the meats and then the vegetables. Um, another uh, thing you can do is to just check what's on sale and shop accordingly. Um, look and see if the... Um, chickens on sale, um, if there happens to be any fish on sale, uh, maybe um, pork tenderloin is on sale. That's usually an expensive cut, but a very, very lean cut. And um, shop that way, you know, if, if unless you're having a special meal, a special uh, dinner. Um, most of the time, most folks are just happy to eat something that someone else has cooked for them. So buying that meat on sale and then choosing your vegetable, and those can be purchased on sale as well, is a great way to go. And the store cycles what they put on sale. So that can be your approach. Um, meat freezes well. It'll freeze for several months at zero degrees Fahrenheit, and you can check online for all of those guidelines. So if you find a really good deal, um, you can buy a little extra and freeze it. Um, when it comes to your fresh produce, and I love when y'all have good intentions and you eat more veggies. That's what we talk about a lot in our consults. Um, but try to be um, practical and buy the amounts that you will need, the amounts that you and your family will eat. If you do end up getting a little extra, you can steam um, them or cook and freeze them for later. Um, a common practice of people with gardens, they will blanch vegetables and uh, then freeze them uh, with the intention of using them later on after the garden has, has died down. Um, another thing you can do with herbs is uh, try and use them for different dishes and things you might not think of. Uh, cilantro, for example, is really good in Latin dishes like, say, enchiladas, that type of thing. Uh, but it's also a common ingredient in um, Thai cooking. Um, so you might plan your plan your um, menu knowing you've got a, a batch of 
cilantro in the um, in the refrigerator and try to use it up. And then you can also just experiment. You know, throw some cilantro on um, some chicken that you roasted or uh, in some vegetable soup that you made and just try a few things and use it up. Let's see here. Now, the um, I oftentimes get questions about should I buy um, uh, organic or regular produce and in a perfect world we should all have our very own gardens and we should all eat organic produce. But um, life's not always that simple. So there is a uh, website, um, the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, that keeps an updated list of what they call the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. And that is a, um, a real handy uh, resource so that you can determine uh, how to better spend your money. In other words, um, uh, let's say, um, you know, you look over here and you see avocados at the top of the Clean 15 list. Um, and the tropical regions, they really do grow abundantly. So they probably don't need to put pesticides on them. So you might save your uh, produce budget for, say, strawberries to buy as an organic because they are frequently at the top of the list of the dirty dozen. They have a very tender skin and uh, when they have pesticides applied, they will tend to soak them up. So you can buy organic strawberries and just regular avocados to save money that way. Let me check the question box. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, I'm sorry. It looks like we had, can you see the screen now? I'm not sure how that happened. All righty. Sorry about that. Okay, let me go back a, a couple slides. Um, this is my first national webinar, so I'm still figuring out the buttons. I didn't realize you was sorry about that. <laughs> All righty. Uh, let me go back just to, well, you heard what I said. So these are the slides to that. I think we put pretty much covered those things. So we'll go ahead and proceed. All right. All righty. Um, so here we go. There's your clean 15 and your dirty dozen. And you can look that up um, at um, ewg.org, the Environmental Working Group. They have a good website. And uh, they change it from time to time, uh, pretty much seasonally. Uh, one thing I've always found real interesting is how watermelon is typically, um, you know, you just aren't going to see it on these lists because they typically don't apply uh, pesticides in growing watermelon because they grow so well. Uh, so that's another one you can, you, you probably won't even see a, a, an organic option for that one. So you can spend your, um, spend your money according to the need. Let's see here, and on that note, let's do another poll. All righty, now then. And the question is, what book was published in 1962 warning about the harmful effects of pesticides. Was it A, To Kill a Mockingbird, B, Sugar Blues, C, The Sea Around Us, or D, Silent Spring? And we're getting a good variety of answers here. I'm sure y'all knew To Kill a Mockingbird was not the answer, but it was published in 1960, and it's a great book. All righty. I think we're about ready to close our poll. I'll go ahead and close the poll, and I will share the results with you. 
and you can see that 22% of you chose Sugar Blues, and that is an actual book that was written back in the day about the effects of sugar. Uh, 22% of you chose The Sea Around Us, um, and that is an actual book written by Rachel Carson. Uh, but the answer, and 56% of you saw that, is D, Silent Spring, and that was a book written in Back in the 60s, published in 62 by Rachel Carson, it was, it was pretty controversial. She's a marine biologist, but she was a woman, and uh, they kind of thought she was crazy. But it's considered a landmark work that set the stage for the envir environmental movement um, that uh, we've seen form since that time. So that's the answer, Silent Spring. All righty. Good job. Now then, um, when you are shopping at the store for your non-perishables, um, you do want to spend some time, like we mentioned before, checking your uh, nutrition facts. And uh, an easy example would be rice versus a rice mix pouch. So um, many of the little rice mixes will contain a whole lot of salt, many, many additives and preservatives. Um, it will have some flavorings in it, uh, but they're, they're generally not a, a healthy food. Okay, You'll do better to just uh, buy your own brown rice. And even if you're in a quick hurry, if you don't have time to chop onion and add those types of flavorings, um, you could use onion powder. You could use all kinds of herbs and spices out of the cabinet, that kind of thing. Um, but when it comes to your non-perishables, your, your plain uh, rice, oats, those things are going to be much, much cheaper than those uh, mixes and pouches. Uh, you can also buy these things in bulk, like your rice, your quinoa, your oats, your nuts, your whole wheat flour. And by the way, if you uh, plan to do any holiday baking, and would like to experiment with some whole wheat flour, um, I always recommend whole wheat pastry flour. It's made from a soft wheat, and it really works much better in baking, and you're, you'll turn out with a better result, and a lot of times people don't even realize that you have used a whole wheat flour. So um, you might want to try that. Also, you can choose local or store brands. And uh, as we mentioned before, you can check uh, the unit cost. So when it comes to tackling the grocery store and looking for seasonal foods, this is your best way to save money and get great tasting produce, uh, buying the stuff that's in season or local. And one way you can do that is going to your um, local farms or farmer's markets. It is often cheaper and it uh, often tastes better and it certainly can support your local community and more and more people are having their own gardens once again nowadays. That's not a new thing. There's just a, a resurgence of that. Uh, you might even talk to some of your neighbors. Maybe if they've got a sunnier yard than you do, they could share some of their uh, produce and you could share uh, something else that you're able to grow or provide. Um, when the produce is not so much in season. You might do better for cost purposes to buy um, frozen or canned produce. That might be a better way to go about it. And one thing I've really enjoyed is that I can get uh, uh, relatively inexpensive bags of organic frozen berries at different stores nowadays. Uh, and they they take they're you know they're not as good as the fresh but if it's the middle middle of the winter um, it's nice to have some um, and the fact that they are organic uh, I, for me is important I try to get my berries uh, organic since they tend to be higher in pesticides so uh, off season you can rely on frozen or canned you can also try gardening like we talked about. Um, people don't often realize how much beverages can add to their cart. And if you doubt that, look at the beverage aisle of your store. There's actually several beverage aisles. There's uh, about a half to a whole aisle in most stores I've seen for just juices and juice drinks, which is a little bit of juice and a lot of 
sugar and water and coloring and flavorings. Um, and then that doesn't even count the um, uh, soft drink aisle, the uh, flavored waters aisle. There's just a whole lot of beverages that are um, for sale. And if you most of the time stick to water with your meals, uh, that's really best for your health anyway, generally speaking, and you're going to save a ton of money. Um, I'm a tea and coffee drinker, so I'm, I'm going to include those things. Um, but if you make your own coffee at home and don't go to the coffee shop, unless it's just, just a treat or to meet a friend, you'll save so much money that way. And like I tell so many of my patients, um, if they're having, uh, you know, caramel mocha lattes, I'll say, honey, that is not coffee. That is a milkshake. So for your health and for uh, calories, all of that, uh, the fancy foo-foo drinks at the coffee shops really are better to just have as an occasional treat, not as a regular drink. Because remember, it's not a cup of coffee, it's a milkshake. All righty, let's talk about coupons. Uh, nowadays, stores have their loyalty cards and their in-store specials. Uh, seems like more and more people really are using the company websites and social media to find bargains. And then there's always the standard manufacturer coupons and the store coupons that many times they'll have right as you walk in the store. And again, many times you can quickly check these out online just by looking up the store's website and seeing what is the uh, what are the coupons for this week. Um, don't purchase the food just because it is discounted. Um, that can be a tempting thing, but many times the um, the foods are junk foods. They really are. Um, I don't use coupons a lot anymore because it's more of a time uh, versus savings issue for me. But um, sometimes I will use them, and especially to try a new product. That's uh, For me, that's a fun way to do it if it's discounted. Um, but if it's a junk food and you don't need it, you're not going to save anything by getting it with a coupon, especially on a regular basis. Um, you know, if, if it's just not good for your health, it doesn't matter what the price is. You don't want to pay the price later. So try to be uh, careful when you're tempted to use those coupons. Obviously, when the thing's on sale and you use a coupon, you can really reduce the price. Some people get their uh, paper towels and their Windex and things like that for free because they'll pay attention to the store ad. And again, so easy to look at that online nowadays. And then they'll apply their coupons. And if the stores double it, you really can have a double whammy there. Um, if you use your coupons a lot for the paper and the cleaning and the foil and the baggies, um, that, that's a great way to save money versus the junk food. Um, and again, double coupons, combining coupons, that sort of thing. Let's see, somebody's got a comment here. Um, a lot of stores now have digital coupons. Oh, that's right. There you go. Um, and you'll find people with their phones out so much more at the grocery store nowadays, and they're using those in, in all these ways. Great comment. Uh, it will, it, there you go. There's your segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, stores have these apps for exclusive coupons. Um, any of your common stores like CVS, Walgreens, Target, etc. Um, Snip Snap has um, it'll save coupons to your app and then track the expirations of those coupons. Um, there are just a number of things you can use. Coupon Sherpa. Um, and um, that will be for the most common grocery items. Um, and then the loyalty cards and all of that kind of thing. And again, you know, it just, I think a lot depends on um, the amount of time that you have and how you intend to use those, um, those perks. <clears throat> but you always stay in the driver's seat. Don't let them drive you. You use them to your advantage and don't let them sway you to buy things that you wouldn't ne necessarily uh, buy or don't need. So you keep your savings intact. All right, meal planning. This is a great way to um, save some money. Now, um, this is my uh, best tip on this. And there's all kinds of standard ways of meal planning. 
Um, I kind of, again, it's kind of a time thing for me, but I do this a lot. I plan my meals backward using my grocery store receipt. So I'll uh, buy what's on sale most often of the uh, meats, uh, the vegetables, the fruits. And then when I uh, get home, and yes, I've put my fruits and veggies on the counter. I'm going to wash them. I'm going to prep them. I'm going to be my own sous chef. Um, and then I'll kind of use my receipt um, at that point and throughout the week to kind of remind myself, oh, okay, let's see here. That's right. I got those, I got those chicken breasts and oh yeah, that broccoli that was on sale. And so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of stir fry that together. That's what I'm going to do. And um, now I don't cook a lot by recipes. I'm, I'm more of a creative experimental cook. Um, so if you're more of a right by the recipe person, you might need to do the traditional meal planning. But this is one approach. So when you are doing the uh, traditional meal planning, you'll want to start with preparation. See what you already have on hand. You know, you don't need to buy um, um, too many extra bags of brown rice if you already have three uh, in the pantry. Um, set out your menu for the week. Use what you can of what you already have. Uh, pull out your coupons and see if anything matches up. And then you don't have to feel the pressure to plan seven whole meals but if you just do four or five, typically there's leftovers available, and you can make simple things from those. Um, one of my favorite things to do is keep a soup jar in the freezer. And um, when I have a little bit of leftover uh, peas or uh, rice or a little bit of um, chicken, and especially if there's some meat broth, if I have roasted, whether I've pan or oven roasted a meat, Never, never do I throw those broths out. I will definitely, um, uh, sometimes you have to add liquid and scrape it up, but I, I keep that good flavorful broth and I will add it to my soup jar. Um, and as I add to it over time, um, eventually it's full and it becomes the basis of a nice pot of soup and I don't have to usually add too much to it. And the flavors are incredible because there's so many good rich flavors in there. So that's one of my little tricks. Here's an example of a, um, a uh, menu planner. Um, I have seen others that I thought were clever where they had the different days of the week, uh, but usually it's Monday through Friday. And then on the same page, they've got the grocery list space. So you kind of keep track of both things in one space. And I like this um, quote from uh, back in 1946, Better Homes and Gardens. Family dinners should be planned with as much thought and care as company dinners. That can be easier said than done. Uh, but also, whenever possible, um, uh, if you have children at home, get them involved at an early age, even doing the simplest of tasks, whether it's setting out the silverware or giving them a little plastic knife and letting them cut soft things, avocado, for example, um, letting them be a part of the meal. It'll train them how to prepare meals as they grow up, and it can also give you a hand uh, in the kitchen. In other words, start before they become teenagers. Oh, here's another coupon. Let's, I mean, another comment. or Oh, same one, digital coupons. Okay. Now then, here's another idea, um, and this idea is mentioned on um, a few different websites. Um, it's the idea of using your crock pot, but preparing the ingredients ahead of time in bags and then, you know, zipper bags and then freezing them. Um, now you might have to freeze it in the shape of your crock, obviously, to fit the food back into it. Um, but it's an easy way to, um, really make a very quick process of fixing a meal. And this can be done on the weekend if you're a busy working person. And if all you have time to do is grab something out of the freezer, set it in a machine, plug it in, and turn on the button, this might be a good technique for you. And then, as we know, it cooks during the day, and, oh, it's so nice to come home to a, a nice cooked meal. Um, if you are um, uh, not working outside of your home, but you still, you know, you have busy things you need to do, this is still a great idea, especially for winter months. This can also get you thinking ahead and planning so that you are uh, looking for those ingredients, buying what is on sale, and saving money.
So um, from the CHC team, clinical health consultants, uh, here's some of our favorite meal planning and cooking resources. Everybody loves Pinterest, and that is fun to look at with all the pictures and the, the good quick ideas. Um, as you're looking through those things, try to keep in mind what has the most whole grain, what has the most um, vegetable, um, you know, what has the, uh, the leanest proteins, those kinds of things. And um, th those would be some ideas for choosing the, the healthy foods. Um, but all of these are really good resources to help you with your, your meal planning. And I'm going to leave it on this for just a minute so that you can jot those down if you would like to. Does anyone out there have a favorite that they like? If you have um, some favorite resources that you like, especially for meal planning or quick healthy meals, feel free to share that with us and that, that I will mention that to the group. Alrighty, I'll go ahead and move on. Uh, here's a, a little more data, a little more interesting information. Um, and this chart shows us the changes over time. Uh, yes, the, the session is being recorded and it can be viewed later, as a matter of fact. Thank you for asking. Yes, indeed. Um, this chart shows, <laughs> you're welcome, uh, this chart shows the change over time in uh, going from eating foods at home to eating away from home or basically eating home prepared meals versus restaurant eating. Um, and, you know, I think we all know that these Changes has hap ha these changes have happened over time, um, but this chart shows that the portion of the nat national food budget around 1930 was about 12.7%, and then that rose to 42% in 2012. I'm sure I'm sure y'all can think of some obvious reasons for that: um, increased incomes, um, more working women even more advertising. You know, we, we become a little more interested to go to those restaurants when we continue to see those commercials run all the time. Um, even just the, uh, not only are many times in families, both uh, parents working, but as populations and cities have grown, um, there's oftentimes significantly less time due to longer commute. So there's a lot of reasons, but if you can um, be savvy and use some clever strategies, like we were talking about the crock pot meals, for example, uh, even if you were eating out um, four dinners a week right now, if you just reduce that to two, and I'm thinking of, uh, you know, four out of your Monday through Friday work week, if you reduce that by half, that is a big deal. And I can guarantee you, um, you'll go from uh, um, reds and yellows to more greens on your lab report. Um, that is just bound to happen. Um, and my goodness, you're going to save a lot of money. Even just fast food meals nowadays run about... Um, seven dollars very very often and sometimes more um, and if you go to a nice sit-down dinner it's a lot <laughs> so um, and those it is wonderful and I, I'm I certainly love eating out myself it's fun it's it's an event for me um, but on a day-to-day -day basis when you just need to feed the family on a weeknight as much as you can have a, a home-cooked dinner um, that is certainly going to save money Now, when you are eating out, when you are eating on the run, run, the first rule is just get water to drink. You don't need soft drinks. Um, boy, we could, I could have a whole lecture on the problems with those in terms of the sugars, the high fructose corn syrup, the effect on your teeth, the effect on your bones, the effect on your kidneys. Um, and they're going to add a lot of money to your bill. So if you just look at it from a budgetary standpoint, just choose water. Um, also, you can just choose a smaller amount of food. If you are constantly walking out of your restaurant with a styrofoam box in your hand, um, 
you know, sometimes we have good intentions, but sometimes that food doesn't necessarily get eaten. So try ordering um, smaller plates um, or splitting food with someone who is dining with you um, or just ordering an appetizer. Um, those are some strategies to save money. Also, there are many times weekly deals um, at restaurants in your area or coupons. And then um, if you are ordering, maybe it's a favorite dish they have at a restaurant, you can go ahead and box up half of your meal to take home for uh, lunch the next day. Or if somebody's willing to share that meal, that's a great way to save some money. You know, a lot of restaurants used to charge a plate charge. I don't see that much anymore. That doesn't seem to be as common for sharing a meal. Does anybody have any restaurant money-saving tips? Share those if you have them. Okay, the art of leftovers. Sometimes people like to call them planned overs, just making extra to have leftovers. Um, if you have, and this is, you know, this is where you really can do your planned leftovers is to roast the whole chicken or cook extra uh, roast, that kind of thing. So you've got your extra proteins. Uh, you can certainly add them to salads, and that could be an evening meal. This is where you could do your plan, your, you know, four meals of the week, and then you're going to use your leftovers for another meal. You could put that protein on a big salad, and that could be a, a nighttime dinner. Um, you could use that protein to make tacos. You could add it to a soup. Um, that could be your soup jar or a soup you're making that night. You could use it in a stir fry. Um, and what a great healthy way to make your sandwich. Um, instead of just using the deli meats. For your vegetables, you can use those in a stir fry, broccoli for example. Um, and if you have, um, say, a big head of broccoli and you've come home from the store and you, you stop right at your sink and you set it down, you got your colander, you got your cutting board, you got your knife. If you go ahead and, and process the whole thing, um, one thing you can do is uh, take uh, some of the broccoli florets and even some of the stems. You can peel the uh, hard exterior with a vegetable peeler and then slice them in, in uh, nice little slices. But you can blanch that broccoli. You just take a pot of boiling water and you just submerge that broccoli into that boiling water just until it turns a beautiful bright green. And then you immediately... Uh, Take the broccoli out of the boiling water and plunge it into some ice water. That is called blanching, and that ice water will uh, stop the cooking process. But by blanching it, you stop some of the enzymes that are in that vegetable that would cause it to go bad so soon, and it'll actually keep a little longer, and that would be a perfect one to use um, in a, um, a stir-fry. Uh, actually, I like, them. I, I like it blanched in my salad. And if you deal with any um, thyroid issues, it's probably better for you to avoid raw cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, um, kale, Brussels sprouts. So to have them cooked should be better for you. Um, vegetables can be added to a soup. Um, and I, if you're my patient, you hear me talk about beans all the time. So any leftover beans it can go into any kind of a soup at all. Um, you can even puree them in a blender and put them in a, a soup if you want it done that way. Uh, but any leftover vegetables, it doesn't have to be exactly according to your recipe. Um, and if you've got any picky eaters in the family, then you can take leftover vegetables, puree them, and sneak them into soups and casseroles. Um, I mentioned the soup jar in the freezer. You can also use leftover veggies like spinach, for example, um, the next morning with your eggs as an omelet or scrambled. And that's a great way to add in some more um, low starch veggies to your meal. You can make a uh, homemade pizza, and that would be a good way to use mushrooms. Again, just anything, uh, uh, spinach, uh, red or green or yellow peppers, that kind of thing. And a, uh, a quick, uh, lower-carb way of making a um, pizza crust would be uh, pita bread, uh, whole wheat pita bread out of the deli. You just take a, a sharp knife and you carefully cut around so that you open up both halves of it. And that can be a fun uh, family dinner night where everyone makes their own pizza. Uh, you can 
Um, use leftover vegetable broth uh, to cook rice and get the nutrients out of it. And you can also throw, as many people do nowadays, any of this into um, a smoothie. I mean, I would I would have my limits. Uh, you know, certain things I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't probably put turnips in my smoothie. But um, uh, that's an, that brings me to another idea that um, the um, that I like to. Uh, do anytime and also recommend for families with um, picky eaters is pumpkin puree. This time of year, um, as you're buying your carving pumpkins, if you see any of the little sugar sweet pumpkins, the ones that are intended for eating, you can roast those, bake them in the oven yourself, or honestly, I just get canned pumpkin myself. And you can freeze that canned pumpkin in little, like an ice cube tray or little containers, uh, pop them into a zipper bag, and then you can pop a couple of those uh, chunks of frozen pumpkin puree um, into your smoothie, into your chili pot, um, anything that it can just sort of melt away into, and it'll add a lot of good beta carotene, which is the active form of vitamin A. So you know you're adding a little more nourishment to your family's meal, and it's just going right under the radar of those picky eaters. Let's see, we have a question here. What is the problem with um, the vegetables and the thyroid issues? One of the sulfur compounds in them tends to interfere with um, uh, the uh, thyroid, with your medication. So uh, if you have, for example, low thyroid and you're on medication for it, it's better that you avoid those raw cruciferous vegetables. Great question. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Let's see here. Okay, we're doing pretty good. Just got another couple of minutes. Um, fruit, when I say um, combined with, I reread this and I thought, well, I don't really mean to, you know, mush the banana in with some nuts in a bag. But if you are um, having some fruit that's uh, left over, like fruit salad, if you are taking that with you for a snack, you could also have some nuts with it. So you're having the protein and the fat of the nuts and the carbs of the fruit, and that makes a, a good snack. Um, you can obviously add them to a smoothie. You can throw them in a salad. You can add them to some um, plain Greek yogurt. And this time of year, I love to make a hot fruit compote. You know, just cook it up and add some cinnamon, uh, a small amount of sweetener. Let's see, we have another question. I have three kids trying not to buy the junk food for them, trying to get the whole family to eat better. Do you know of any alternatives to for cookies and chips? Um, well, you know, the best thing is not buy it and get people off of it is the main thing. And then provide, and, and as their taste buds change, they'll crave it less. Um, and it's not that you can't ever have another cookie in your life, but if you don't keep them in the cupboard all the time, you won't. Uh, grow so addicted to them, I guess is a simple way to say it. Um, you can also look for recipes that incorporate things like medjool dates as a sweetener so that when you do make some sweet treats, there's even brownie recipes using dates as sweetener. Um, you know, it's a nourishing sweet treat. But the main thing is just don't bring it home all the time. And if you're going to eat them, I say make them. Make them out of healthy ingredients and when you're standing up and you're going to the trouble to, to get your hands in there and make it and get your kids involved, um, you're exerting the energy. So it's sort of like you've earned it. Um, and you can control the ingredients more. You can also bag up a few cookies at a time, throw them in the freezer. So it might be easier to stay out of the cookie jar than if the, the, uh, you know, the whole batch is sitting on the counter. That's a great question, too, and that's something everybody struggles with. All righty, uh, your grains and starches and beans. You can add green peas to a salad. You can throw that brown rice in a stir fry, black eyed peas. We might not think of putting something like that in a soup. Um, any of those beans can go in a soup. And then even a breakfast grain bowl. I know it sounds a little unconventional, but quinoa and lentils as a hearty kind of a a uh, breakfast meal is going to start your day with a, a good shot of protein. It'll keep you more alert and you wouldn't have a like a sinking spell around 10 o'clock as if you ate, say, uh, pancakes or syrup, a lot of sugar in the morning. So those are some ways you can use those leftovers.
So here are some places to visit, couponmom.com, uh, some of the blogs, some of the state extension websites. Um, yeah, my goodness, there's a thousand recipes out there. USDA is one of them. Um, and then the various apps, like we mentioned before. Now then, so if you invest the time, you got your knowledge, we talked today, you sit down for just a few minutes, make a plan, and uh, you can save some money. You're obviously interested in doing that, and that's why you're here today. So I, I really appreciate you attending. Here's some references if you want to uh, check out more of what we were talking about. Um, one I, uh, I really like on there is Cooking Light. Dot com. That's always been a good resource for some um, healthy recipes and food tips. Um, I also happen to like a lot of the recipes on the um, Diabetes Association website because they're real clever uses of uh, vegetables, very vegetable focused, and that's diabetes.org. Um, and then um, uh, any of the recipes that you can uh, find, you know, make simple substitutions to make them healthier. If they call for rice, try brown rice in that recipe. Um, if they call for sugar, try reducing the amount a little bit. There's ways you can play around with most recipes. And again, this is being recorded. So if you'd like to go back to it and look at some of these recipes more closely or these references more closely, um, then you can certainly do that. Now then, do you have any more questions? We do have one final poll question. I'll start getting that ready. We launched this final poll question. Okay, what is the best way to reach a true health clinical health consultant? A, write a letter. That's the old-fashioned way, I guess. B, tweet your opinion on insulin resistance. I am on Twitter. Uh, C, call your doctor's office, or D, call True Health Client Services at 877-443-5227 and then dial zero to reach the client services folks. 40% of you have voted, 50% of you have voted. I think I'm seeing a trend here. All righty, I'm going to go ahead and show the results of this poll. And you got it right. Call True Health Client Services is that number. And if you forget that number, it's right there on your lab report. It's written along the side. Um, and if you'd like more in-depth one-on-one time with myself or one of, uh, one of my colleagues, um, and in addition to dietitians, we are a bunch of um, exercise physiologists, nurses, uh, uh, tobacco treatment specialists, um, certified diabetes educators. Uh, we, we've got a lot of talent on our team, so please feel free to reach out and um, uh, let us help you reach your health goals. We have some uh, other ways that you can reach us through uh, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and our blog, which you can now access directly on our website. Check out the website if you haven't seen it in a while. It's been redone. It's, it's good. Let's see, we got another comment here. Let's see, please send me the PDF. PDF what, of which thing? Tell me what you want the PDF of, and and uh, if you will send me an email, then I'll know who you are because it I, it doesn't show on here. Um, but you can reach me at first initial last name J Overton at TrueHealthDiag.com, just like right here, TrueHealthDiag.com, J Overton at TrueHealthDiag.com. Uh, what else do we have here? I think we're about done. So again, if you'd like to set up an appointment with a clinical health consultant, there's your number. We'll be more than happy to help you, and I hope you've enjoyed this webinar today. Uh, we do have them each month. If you go to our website, you can see what the uh, schedule is. We have flyers that lists, 
list the upcoming uh, webinars, and if you are in our system, you should be getting them by email. Otherwise, ask your clinical health consultant to send you a copy of that flyer. And um, you're so welcome. I really appreciate y'all's interest in this. And uh, if you have any further questions for me, I'm going to just stay on the line a minute and um, I can answer your questions. In fact, let me go back to that one. Let me go back a little bit to the one page. Let's see. Okay, we'll go all the way back. There's one reference source right there. I kind of like that meal planning list. I'll leave it on this a minute, and then I'll go on back to the meal planning list. Um, this webinar is going to be repeated tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And um, so if you only were able to att attend a portion, you can certainly jump back on tonight or watch the recording. I'm going to scroll back up to, uh, there's some more information on resources. I'm going to keep going back a little bit in case y'all want to see the um, – there we go, the meal planning list. I think that's a handy one right there. Let me see if we have any questions now, any other questions. There, I see. All right, I will certainly send the um, information to you, absolutely. Let me make another comment on that question about um, trying not to buy the junk food and get people to eat better and that sort of thing. Um, as I'm working with my patients, one of the things I often recommend are some uh, ways to overcome the cravings as you're trying to get off of the sweets and the junk. So number one, don't put it in your cart. Don't bring it home. Number two, when you get that sweet craving, I recommend three things. Eat a high-protein snack like a boiled egg, um, a small amount of cottage cheese, uh, some tuna fish, you know, a slice of turkey, something that's just a hard-hitting chunk of protein. Um, also drink some water. Sometimes we're actually thirsty when we think we're hungry or craving sweets. Um, and then the next thing is to take a short walk. Um, and that does so many things biochemically to us as far as regulating our blood sugar. Um, uh, it, it will do a lot of things to affect those cravings is the short answer for that. So those three things, a high-protein snack, even nuts would work at that point in time. The protein and the fat content would be effective. Um, and then drink some water. Even you could drink some uh, hot herb tea, you know, sip on something slowly. Um, when people eat high sugar foods on a regular basis, they got, they've got their blood sugar levels bouncing around so much, and that tends to be a big factor in what's driving the continuation of the cravings. When you eat sugary foods, and by the way, don't think I'm sitting on my high horse and don't like a good dessert. Oh, I, I definitely do. So I have to work through these things myself too. But I'm telling you, the more I eat, the more I want. And if I can back away from it, I can do without it more and more. Um, but when you eat sugar or sugary sweetened foods, and this can be sugar, brown sugar, honey, agave, anything like that, um, your blood sugar levels go up very quickly, and um, then they drop back down very quickly and lower than normal as well. If you eat more complex carbohydrates, beans, grains, vegetables, it digests so slowly that your blood sugar levels just go up a little bit kind of slowly and then gently kind of come down kind of slowly. So the graph is more uh, more gentle, kind of like where we would like to see our investments nowadays. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's nice to see the spikes, but when you see the big drops, your, uh, you know, your heart goes in your throat. So um, same thing with your blood sugar. And it's when those big drops in blood sugar happen 
that you feel tired, you can feel irritable, and boy, you better get out of my way because I'm heading for a cookie right now. It's those strong cravings that hit us. So um, those are my best strategies that I teach to turn that around. Um, it's a little addictive. I mean, really, it's like dealing with an addiction to, uh, you know, don't bring it in the house. And, okay, I'm, I'm craving the cookies again. What do I do? Uh, drink some water, eat the protein, take a little walk. Um, and honestly, even just making sure you're getting enough sleep at night. If you're well rested, you're going to not be craving those sugars as much. So that's another big piece of it as well. Let's see if we have any other questions. Okay. Well, folks, I think we're done. I thank you for your time and attention and uh, hope to uh, uh, speak to you again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.